It's exciting and it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Sam and his colleagues and the Adam Smith Institute. Um, it was Sam who, uh, I, I said, hey, I want to do a book tour, and he wanted to do this paper. Which, so you have to blame him for this. It's not really about the book. Um, and when he said he wanted to do this, I said, fine, that'll be fun. Uh, and I assumed we would be six of us little libertarian sectarians gathered, so I'm quite overwhelmed by uh, the interest in this today. Um, I asked Sam to print out all the slides so I can move quick. We're, I know we're going to have to skip some and not read the quotes and so on. Um, but at least you have that, and maybe you can have your pen handy if you get a question or, 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 or want to make a remark. Uh, but I guess I'll blow through this really uh, for a while um, and try to, you know, I hope we have enough time for some questions. Um, the mirror is kind of like mere Christianity, sort of a big tent, and that's, I think, the spirit uh, of the libertarianism uh, that I'm pushing towards here. Here's a, sort of a 20th century story, at least from here. These two people were both heavily influenced by uh, their common mentor, Mises. He was more, be more of a mentor to him than he was to him. I think he was more mature and formed and different uh, all along. Um, and these guys have been, you know, epic figures, I'd say, in the 20th century uh, renaissance of classical liberalism uh, and, and the American libertarian scene. Um, and what I think I'm driving toward is a blending, uh, which, as it were, takes the better parts of both, and in a way returns back to this. I'm actually more of a fan of Hume and Smith than I am of the 20th century figures, even Hayek. Um, I think that mere libertarianism is increasingly the way people think of libertarianism. So I think I'm uh, saying and endorsing uh, a trend that's in motion and relating it to these two figures. Um, the most essential characteristic, as I see it, is favoring, by and large, more liberty. It's not about axioms or non-aggression principles, deduction, and so much, so, so, so on. <clears throat> um, I think that semantics are an essential part of classical liberal culture and thinking. Um, <clears throat> I'd say especially the distinction between voluntary and coercive action uh, and the liberal conceptions of ownership that it's, that it's based on, and that's really our basis for our definition of liberty. These are, I, I think, the most important words of liberal culture. All of these words are greatly confused and often directly subverted towards the end of the 19th century and moving forward, and now we're in an age of cultural confusion engulfed by social democratic political reaction to uh, the age of liberalism as I see it. Nothing says that more than how, I how much trouble I have using this word in the country I hail from. Um, okay. <clears throat> so there's, defin there's the definition of liberty with its sort of central idea, and we should distinguish that from claims for liberty. And I suggest that on the definition of liberty, Rothbard's pretty darn good. Uh, I, I, I like his elaboration of, as it were, the definition of liberty, particularly in this book, but in his other works as well. Uh, he actually made a project of defining liberty. He also made claims for it, which I'm not so enthusiastic about. Um, but it seems to me that uh, this is one matter where um, I favor Rothbard, and that's a very important matter. Um, so on this first issue, I, in my scorecard, as it were, <laughs> Rothbard wins. Hayek is quite obscure in the definition of liberty. Now I think there are a lot of obscurities uh, in, in it, uh, uh, and maybe more than Rothbard recognized. Um, but um, Hayek was, I think, quite obscure, contradictory, multiple, and so on. Um, he tended to define liberty in terms of some of its appealing correlates. 
I think that between the lines, one can read Locke come Rothbard, if you will, into Hayek's liberty, but in word, Hayek does not provide any such um, hearty definition. It may have been for the best that Hayek was obscure in this fashion had he been more explicit and made it clear that he was thinking about a basic distinction like fellows like this, he would have been dismissed at the time and even more marginalized. Whether this was conscious or not, or how conscious, I would only speculate. But in a way, it may have been for the best that he was obscure in the definition. Now, on, the, on Rothbard's definition, I work towards an idea of the, what I call the liberty principle. Um, and it works from the status quo, which is not actually a very Rothbardian anchor. He likes to think about the libertarian ideal, the end zone, if you let me use the American football analogy. Um, and these reforms, R1 and R2, are reforms from the status quo, where we're at, as it were. Um, and, and liberty can sometimes rank two such reforms. And I have this little symbol here as an ordering, okay, which ranks R1 and R2. If R1 is abolishing the minimum wage and R2 is the status quo, which is to say no reform at all, you know, we would have R1 ranking higher in liberty. This is a way of thinking about liberty as a statement about uh, at least the ranking of policy reforms. Now, there's a very important, I think, quite important distinction to bring in here. It's kind of complicating things right away, but let's try to get it out of the way. It is possible that a reform that increases the direct initiation of coercion will, in the long run, reduce coercion. These are a couple of possible examples. The, the policy itself, or the reform itself, um, might score higher in liberty than the alternative reform within the status quo, but, um, or lower in liberty, but have the opposite ranking in a more overall sense. Um, like if you have an urban riot, imposing a curfew is sort of a direct initiation of coercion by the police, but if it quells initiation of coercion by rioters, it might, that might redeem the increased coercion of the police in imposing the curfew. I wrote a whole paper with Michael Clark on this distinction. I think they're real and important. And in fact, I think one of the things that, one of the ways to, dis to distinguish or negotiate the differences between libertarians and conservatives is that libertarians see less disagreement between direct and overall, whereas conservatives see more relative to libertarians disagreement. So what do we do? This, this is sort of the direct, the, based on the initiation of coercion by the policy itself and concomitant enforcement. And you could go all the way out speculating into the future of the overall effects of such a reform uh, based on a prediction of coercion resulting from ramifications of the policy. So this outer point, which is not clearly defined, I realize, but still the outer edge of what we can talk about would be the overall, and this would be the direct, and that would be the basis of two different notions, and if you will, orderings by liberty. So liberty itself is an ambiguous ranking to this extent. Um, and which should we use? Ultimately, we care more about this. Presumably, this ultimately tracks the desirable better than this. I mean, this subsumes that. So overall, <coughs> would be truer to our ultimate ethics. Um, however, this is very vague. We don't have good agreement on the long-run consequences of going to war or imposing a curfew or liberalizing finance, financial operations for which taxpayers might ultimately be on the hook and so on. And to keep things kind of clear in our liberty talk, what we do is we tend to work with this. And I think that's what libertarians in the US do anyway. Maybe it's different here, I'm not sure. Um, and so I'm going to stick with this, but I've gone through all this just to show that there is this issue. And we're making a decision in opting with uh, direct liberty, which I do think is in very much in the, in the 
spirit of American libertarianism. So we have an order, and it's the direct liberty order, and that's what the little D is for. <clears throat> it's grounded in the status quo. It ranks dyadic reforms. It's presumably transitive about the reforms. Um, claims for liberty involve judgments about liberty as a principle for action and policy. We need a principle relating it to the desirable. So this finally is the liberty principle. It's, just, it's <coughs> you're wondering why this notation, but I actually find it kind of useful. Um, when R1 rates higher in liberty than R2, then favor, then favor R1 over R2, okay? In other words, when it's higher in liberty, it's higher in this D here now is desirability. Um, but sometimes when you want to clarify the cases and distinctions we're talking about, this comes in handy. Now about this desirability ordering, this is in the loose, vague, and indeterminate, as Adam Smith would put it. Again, it ranks dyadic reforms. It reflects your judgment, which buttons you push. It emerges from your sensibilities, which are deep and complex. Not something you can fully or clearly articulate or turn into a formula. Don't even try it. <clears throat> Smith scoffs at such an idea. Claims for the liberty principle. Rothbard's were too strong, too categorical, too simplistic, too absolute. I will set out five limitations of his claims, or his type of claims. So you see, this is primarily really a critique of Rothbard. <clears throat> um, ambiguity. Rothbard tended to make it sound cut and dry, but there are many gray areas. Here's just a few. Um, they're all over the place. Sometimes we are uncertain about whether this ranks higher than that, even in terms of direct liberty, or that ranks higher than that, because we're not sure what liberty means, what property means, what messing with someone's property means in this case. Here's a nice quote, some nice quotes from Hayek, um, where he shows sensitivity that Rothbard glosses over, or, or even maybe perhaps explicitly denies. So that's one. Ambiguity. Second, undesirability. Lib uh, Rothbard treated the liberty principle as an axiom. He made 100% like a, like an ethical trump. He made 100% claims for it. Um, whereas Hayek condoned some coercive government actions, rejecting 100%. So for Hayek, it would be more of a maxim, a 90-something percent. And you might make a distinction here between a natural axiom, as Rothbard touts it, versus a natural maxim. And I believe in the natural maxim, and I believe in natural here in a Hume-Smith sense. Even though Hume said that justice is an artificial virtue, he actually comes around and says, should make a big deal out of this natural, artificial, in another sense, it's natural. Um, and I think he was winking at us about the natural talk. Um, so here again, on the question of sometimes it fails desirability, uh, I, I reject Rothbard in favor of Hayek, which is to say sometimes we don't follow the liberty principle. Sometimes coercion is our friend. Uh, here are some possible examples. You know, we could come up with others. Uh, immigration might be an interesting one that's not on my list. Um, some of these bring us back to issues of direct versus overall but it doesn't really matter. There's still pure undesirability. And even if you had an overall liberty ranking, I don't think we should insist on a 100% claim. There may be, well be cases where even we would depart from overall liberty for the sake of desirability. Very much against the spirit of Rothbard. All this helps us to avoid brittleness. 100% claims are brittle. You show one counterexample and it shatters. So I don't think it's been really good, good for liberty, the Roth Party and strain. So on uh, ambiguity, Hayek wins. On undesirability, Hayek wins. This is a little elaboration about separating desirability from liberty. Um, Again, the maximum is 90-something percent. That doesn't mean it's not still a principle. Exceptions don't destroy principlehood, if you will. 
This was very much part of the Scottish Enlightenment. They allowed exceptions. It was still a principle and it made for a presumption, which put the burden of proof on the contraveners of the principle. And that's, I think, the spirit we should have, that, that, that Scottish spirit. Um, they both, however, failed to say that sometimes coercion is our friend. And you could think of that, see, I, I remember Hayek, I didn't like on the definition of liberty, and you could say that Hayek molded his definition of liberty to fit his sensibilities about the desirable. In some cases, you actually kind of see him building the desirable into his definition of liberty. And in both cases, you could kind of see, it's a little more clear with him, that they both avoid ever saying, sometimes coercion is our, vent, our friend, him by in some sense screwing up the definition, him by in some sense making his sensibilities about the desirable fit his definition. And so both of these, I think, are wrong, and this is um, what I'm advocating, and this, I think, is very much in line with uh, the namesake of our institution here. Here's a quote, uh, an interesting quote about small denomination notes, where he actually says, this, is a vi this, this certainly seems to be a violation of natural liberty, but I'm for it. It's an exception. I don't think he does a great job of actually overcoming that burden of proof. Uh, as he, I don't think he did a great job on usury and maybe a few other cases, but that's sort of neither here nor there. He actually explicit. I think this is a very important passage because it makes it clear that he's saying, I've got this principle and, I'm, and it's not 100%, but it's still a principle and the burden of proof is on uh, the, the contraveners. Exactly as Bentham said to Smith when he said on usury, he said, you taught us that we should have this presumption and that the contraveners should... Uh, provide the burden of proof. And frankly, sir, as much as I admire you and love you, I don't think you've done so on the matter of usury. JB says, say, does say so something similar. So I'm invoking guys like that. Now another dimension of all this is incompleteness. The liberty principle is an incomplete guide to public policy, for in many cases it simply does not apply. There are many, many questions which are just not liberty questions. They're about government resources and the governance or use of government resources, for example. And it's foolish to think that this is a liberty issue. The government, as it were, is the owner of those resources. They should be granted a legitimacy and authority, as Hume and Smith would, and they have their decisions to make. Rothbard, on the other hand, suggests that such questions are beyond the pale of reason discourse. You know, he kind of wanted to say, well, the resources should be privatized. That's all there is really to know or say about this. Again, trying to make the confine issues to the liberty principle. And here again, I think Hayek was much better. <coughs> so on incompleteness, Hayek too gets a check above Rothbard. Um, this is a little kind of schematic, you know, conceptual thing with these three practical limitations just discussed. And you, if you pick, up a, you pick out an issue, you could kind of think about, is this an ambiguity issue, or is it more of an undesirable, undesirability <coughs> issue, or it's an exception to the liberty principle, or is it an incompleteness issue? Um, and, and I think in my paper, I f use a few examples to, as it were, locate them in that space. Two philosophical weaknesses of Rothbard. Libertarian policy does not serve all human <coughs> values. Collective romance, what I've called the people's romance, would be one, identity <coughs> issues are related, would be another. Um, and, you know, on some human values, this is not the most effective answer. Uh, and you gotta make a choice. It's like, you gotta kind of, it's, if you're gonna go with this, you gotta say, yeah, I recognize this, but this is not worth the cost in other dimensions. Rather than pretend that this wins on all fronts. Um, Rothbard, I think, would, would, would have a dismissive tone uh, view of any other such values. <clears throat> Hayek was better. Uh, some quotes here, I won't read them, but you have more of that sense that he's got a moral vision and it's a choice and it doesn't serve all moral visions or all moral values. And then the other philosophical limitation is foundation. He acted like we could fully articulate 
our sensibilities, provide sort of an algorithm of desirability. Um, it was sort of, liberty was sort of a supreme moral and ethical imperative. Um, whereas Hayek is much less foundationalist, even anti-foundationalist perhaps. He was sort of a postmodern before the, the age of that in a way. Um, and this is a nice quote to that effect, but I won't read it. So there again, Hayek gets some checks that Rothbard, you know, rather than Rothbard. <clears throat> so I've listed all these limitations of claims for liberty, these five, in fact, you see checked here. Does it survive those limitations? And I say, yeah. Um, one of the reasons to explore them is to see that they are not fatal. All rival ideologies are plagued by similar limitations, and maybe more, or at least maybe worse. In fact, I think most of them are worse. If we have a by and large 90% something principle, a lot of them don't even have principles, right? They just look mush. Um, so I say liberty still remains a cogent t challenge, um, and, it, and, and so on. All right, so here I go into how Rothbard was a challenger, picking up on the challenging and analytical <coughs> powers of the liberty principle. Um, and I'm gonna have to skip all this bargaining and challenging analysis um, in the interest of time. Uh, I'm for both, I'm for both, uh, as well as um, what I also term royalty. And these are the only two figures I really see in this camp where they're both first among their peers and then their peers are, as it were, a mountaintop in the culture of the society generally. And both of these gentlemen, uh, I think, pretty well fit that description. Um, but this, this trichotomy of bargaining, challenging, and loyalty, I just think we'll have to leave <coughs> aside. As for the name of the Party of Liberty, um, I don't really want to get into this. I'm not at all that wedded to libertarian. You can see in the title of my book that I use liberal. Um, I kind of see libertarianism becoming more Smithian, and I would also like to see liberalism return to being more Smithian. And you know, so I think different contexts make different terms useful. This paper was published in 2004, and I've become a little less libertarian talk oriented, but I'm still quite happy with, with this paper. Um, so, summing up, attitudes of this mere libertarianism. View it as being concerned only with legal and policy issues, not as a system of more moral or ethical principles for human conduct. It is not a philosophy of life. See, being a libertarian to mean merely tending to favor policy reforms toward more liberty, or degovernmentalization, if you like. Formulate political questions in terms of policy brass tacks, uh, as the Adam Smith Institute does. Formulate policy issues chiefly as a choice between alternative reforms to current arrangement. Keep it anchored in the status quo, rather than as policy for some ideal society. Um, like I'm not entirely opposed to the more utopian discourse, um, but it should be primary. Uh, in other words, focus on directions, not destinations. Define liberty pretty much as Rothbard does. Mind the liberty principles, three practical limitations, ambiguity, undesirability, and incompleteness. Admit that there are some human values, I'm sorry, that some human values are ill-served by libertarian reform. Argue for your judgments, but do not attempt to provide an algorithm for judgment or a full account of your sensibilities. View government officials as amenable to intellectual and moral instruction. Um, I just came from Sweden, where there's a right alliance of power, and you guys have David Cameron as your prime minister, so um, some things aren't going so badly. Let's see about the U.S. You say that. <laughs> you wouldn't say that? Um, view government as the agent that validates and institute libertarian reform. As I see it, there is at least one necessary and important role for government, and that is the dismantling of other roles of government. Um, so, that yeah, didn't take so long. Hey, you go through rather quickly. We said thank you, Jeff.
We have actually lots of time for questions, as it turns out. So, um, would someone like to get the ball rolling? Eamon, if you want to kick us off here. Uh, just a question on Hayek. I, I'm, as you know, a great uh, Hayek uh, fan. <clears throat> but one of the criticisms that's been made of, of Hayek's uh, view on liberty is that really uh, he opens the stable door so wide that the entire uh, cavalry could charge through it. Uh, that, you know, when, when he uh, supports uh, conscription, now, a lot of people, you know, a, a Rothbardian would see that as a, an outrageous um, infringement of people's liberty, that you're forcing them to go out and, and, and risk their lives in a, in a war. I, of course, says, oh, well, there may be greater dangers and so on, but, but he's in favor of the government organizing, I don't know, fire department and, and emergencies, uh, earthquakes and evacuations and all sorts of things like that. And the argument is that uh, by, by leaving... Uh, that's so open that, that really you can get anything through it, and, and you could you could say that Hayek is a social democrat rather than a libertarian. Um, I yeah, well I've heard people say that. Uh, I think that's not true to the spirit and the message that we really are, should be getting from Hayek. Um, there's a couple of things about your remarks. I mean, one thing is that um, I think he, he in particularly in the Constitution of Liberty, perhaps, um, says perhaps it would be worthwhile to do this, and it would be consistent with liberty to do this and this and this, when he's not, he's entertaining it, he's allowing it, but he's not strictly endorsing it. I see some strong parallels to Adam Smith in that respect. Um, and. The thing with Hayek is, is he saying that those uh, cases that you just, some of which you just mentioned, are consistent with liberty or the liberty principle? And I think sometimes he is. And that goes to my point about, like you, like you say, he's got such a, such a loose, vague, unclear definition. Not everything should be loose, vague, and indeterminate. Commutative justice in Smith is the one virtue that's grammatical. And commutative justice, not messing with other people's stuff, is the flip side of liberty, because it means the government, too, shouldn't mess with your stuff. And that is grammatical. That is not loose, vague, and determined. By letting it be loose, vague, and determined, maybe, maybe, Smith, maybe Hayek, in the back of his mind, was really thinking in terms of overall liberty. Like, we need to have conscription, because if we don't fend off these monsters, we'll have less liberty in the, overall in the long run. But yeah. Um, you know, I think that we know that Smith's drift really was classical liberal, right? A strong presumption of liberty. Um, to some extent, I think he was bargaining. Uh, to some extent, I just think he was being wise, because I don't think we should have a, a strict principle. Um, so I hope, I hope some, you know, maybe some of this actually can be applied to Hayek's discourse. Okay. The gentleman at the back. Thank you for a most interesting speech. Uh, you make a point of discussing a mere libertarianism, uh, some sort of a synthesis between these two thinkers. You have a check checkboard on which you mark what thinker you think is more appropriate and to which you synthesize more. But is it possible to achieve a mere libertarianism? Because achieve in what sense? To have. Uh, sort of a synthesis of these two thinkers, as you, I um, think you are trying to achieve, yeah? Right. Because in all ideologies you will have divisions on how to achieve political goals, and if you st should stand for your absolutes, <coughs> uh, as you uh, note, the check the, check the rival ideologies, and you will find it there. Is it a dynamic that is necessary in order for political ideas to develop, or could you achieve some sort of a synthesis here? Uh, yeah, uh, in the title I use the word blended. I'm not sure how effective that is, but the point here is not to synthesize them. I mean, I want to get rid of features of both. So it's not to keep everything, it's to... to, 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 to uh, <clears throat> move, take the best and get and figure out how to uh, 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 preserve the best uh, in a more flexible sort of outlook, uh, and it needs to be flexible exactly 
for reasons you say, it needs to interact with policy discourse in the real world and the, the science of the legislator, to use Smith's term, has to connect to the art of politics. Uh, uh, they cannot, they're not ever going to be divorced and they shouldn't be divorced. So this is a, a motion towards something more flexible that uh, is supposed to be both intellectual but uh, you know, useful, responsive to the policy enterprise. Does that make sense? I think I understand what you want to, to achieve. Okay, but I don't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky question to, to answer. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Ben, forgiven. Okay. Um, yeah, you talk about a presumption of liberty. Yeah. Presumably that's something like the presumption of innocence. Correct. Um, but we have that in both the UK and America, but then we also have the National Independence Authorization Act and control orders and that being breached quite often. How do you make sure that when you have a mere presumption of liberty, it doesn't just get breached? I don't have any way to make sure. In fact, it's pretty clear none of us are succeeding in making sure of that. Um, and uh, maybe you're right that even the presumption of innocence is, is routinely and institutionally trampled. Um, But the, the idea of getting towards a presumption of liberty, which I think true liberals really should be embracing, uh, is nonetheless worthy goal. I wonder, Dan, whether Rothbard's absolutism serves a purpose, uh, maybe that you, you, you leave out here, which, is, which speaks to Ben's point, which is that it's a very strong motivating force. Yes. Uh, and these absolutes will perhaps <coughs> rally people to the defense of the, the principle, or even just the maxim, the tendency more than the Hayekian uh, on the one hand, on the other. Uh, so do you, do you see a distinction there if we're talking about, say, tactics rather than philosophy, that maybe Rothbard has some value? Yes, yes, uh, I, I, I see that. Um, there's no question that uh, particularly young people take to Rothbard uh, and his sort of formulas. Um, and they are powerful, and they the, the young people, like, like when I was 17, really feel as though they have found something, and they have really found something. For a lot of the big issues that they're um, acquainted with, or maybe even involved in, like schooling, mm. I hated school, um, <laughs> it, it, it really, you know, these were cases which were not particularly ex exceptions, mm. and uh, they really wanted to deploy that analytical acts, right, and swing it against these, these things that, uh, that should be swung against. Uh, but but uh, it has been wrapped up, I think, particularly by like Mises Rothbard economics, for example, as well as Rothbardian libertarian philosophy um, as, you know, categorical, axiomatic, deductive, praxeology, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and that also, draws in young people because all of a sudden they get to think of themselves as terribly scientific and wise, right, at the age of 21. Um, so there's a dynamic there of kind of bringing people in, getting them committed mm. at, at the formative age because there is a window yeah. of, 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 of formation. Um, yeah, but I think, I think we want to see the limitations of that and okay. so on. And, yeah. Manage it somehow. Terry, you had a question. Terry Arthur, yes. Thank yeah, you. hi. Um, it just seemed to me that uh, you're a little bit, uh, you're assuming that all the coercion right. must be carried out by a government. Um, and you say things like dress policy at schools and so on. You're already assuming that schools are state schools by not making that remark. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me that. It, Government, in all guises, gets bigger, and I don't think I don't think we can see how we're addressing that because it is, it's a matter of fact. Whatever whatever type of government basically just gets bigger and bigger <laughs> because it, that's that's what it does. And I, I, that's why I, I think that in many ways Rock Rock has got it right because you know you must you can't. You can't set the government the one, the one you want, because it, it won't stay like that. And so we should opt for no government. 
Is that the point? And so, and hence, we should opt for no government. <laughs> well, it is an option. I'm not saying I should opt. That's your opening bid. Yeah. Um, so it's an inevitable fact that government gets bigger, and hence, we should have no government. Is that? Um, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. How, uh, how to respond? Um, about I'm not. The point about the dress code in schools was just to acknowledge the reality of some government properties and enterprises uh, and pointing out that uh, the management of those has to make such decisions. Um, I'm not saying that all schools have to be government owned or are government owned, of course they're not. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure how to respond. Okay. Can't that one for now, you. <laughs> I'd just like to um, look at the definition of liberty, and yeah. you mentioned this sort of, um, sort of a lot come high, uh, lot come rock, rock by type definition. Yeah, lots of definition really emerges out of two treaties, which were written just after the uh, the 1688 Congress Revolution as a justification for overthrowing the king and, and so yeah. on. So there's almost a sense in which it's a, it's a claim, how far can we go down the path to changing government, where is the legitimacy founded, yeah. which puts, puts the point about Rothbard being challenging the status quo more up for grabs. But also, I think it actually um, sort of acknowledges, if you go back to, to, to Locke and so on, the um, issues around um, actually defining the sort of liberty and so on, because you're actually talking about um, the difference between amiable and inalienable rights. What might have been given over to, to live in a, a, in a community, you might give over certain aspects, such as the, community, the party wall that you mentioned, that you might say, these are certain things I would give over, allowing allow them to contract away. But I wouldn't contract away property per se. And it's, it's those are the questions. I think Rothbard's probably slightly more alive to that. Um, but certainly the, the, the Lockean um, dimension is, is, is live to that. So I think actually, when you get to two, three, and four, it's not quite as clear that Hayek trumps it completely. But I think Rothbard then gets into problems because when you when you go into his um, sort, of, um, sort of legal codes, his libertarian law codes and so on, even under a free, totally free market system for law, it's very, very prescriptive about this is what the law is. Whereas someone else like Long Fuller actually has a much more of a, a sort of discovery mechanism going on in his thought process about how to do it. So I think that that needs to be probably clarified and explored further rather than a cut and dry that well, well, save giving another lecture. Can you uh, elaborate no, a little further? <laughs> uh, no, that, those were very interesting remarks. Um, my lock is not actually that strong, uh, uh, it, and uh, I'm thinking of the self ownership stuff and you know co consent and, and property and so on, and not so much the question of political authority and revolution. And maybe I shouldn't refer to lock. Um, again, I like Hume and Smith more. Um, um, but you're right that, you know, I just glossed over this property consent concept, contract, sort of the configuration of ownership, if you will, that underlies this liberal idea of liberty. Uh, and and there, there certainly are issues there. Um, I'm not entirely sure why you're suggesting that some of these should be weakened for Hayek. Um, it, or at least they're, they're, they're acknowledged by Rothbard um, to some extent. However, it doesn't actually you know, allow for a sort of discovery process. And just I see. So you think you basically you think that I might be <clears throat> shortchanging Rothbard a little bit here yeah. because he does acknowledge these yeah. and, but then and address just, them. But then he just sort of stamps his view on, on the world. Mm -hmm. and well, okay, okay. that, that might be the basis then. <laughs> yeah, that might be then. Uh, I mean, I, I, I see that, but I tend to see him as underplaying these. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll get right there. Yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, I like in Rothbard and appreciate about him is that uh, he seems to me to be one of the few libertarians bold enough to approach the issue of liberty on equal terms vis-a-vis -vis the statists. Because it seems to me, and I think Rothbard implicitly makes this point, that statists essentially are absolutists. They make the law. They interpret the law, they enforce the law. Sometimes they make references in theory to what we might call natural 
uh, rights as in the US Constitution, but in terms of the actual practice, it doesn't mean much. So uh, it seems to me that uh, Rothbard would say that they are certainly wrong when it comes to the content of their theory, but when it comes to their foundationalism, and I think in this sense we can think of them as foundationalists, they arrogate them to themselves the right of ultimate decision making in every case. Even if in some cases they allow people to decide freely, it's still delegated liberty, yeah. not natural liberty. And it seems to me that Rothbard is right in saying, why should I be? Yeah, I, I half yeah. agree with you. And um, the half, I think, is kind of represented here. Uh, see, I'm holding up Rothbard's definition of liberty. And so I want the semantics to make it clear that those folks in government are initiating coercion. I want it to be clear in the semantics that, you know, the minimum wage, occupational licensing, whatever, pre-market pre approval in drugs is the initiation of coercion, is, is an encroachment on liberty. And I see that as consistent, that preferring to talk that way as consistent with, with Hume and Smith. And if we talk that way, it does help to put that burden of proof on them, okay? And insinuate some of the disparaging uh, descriptions you just gave of them. But still, they, the government is reality. Government's here, it's not going away soon or quickly. Um, it's, like I said, it's the thing that validates libertarian reform. And here, I like Hume and Smith in recognizing, in discussing and, and showing that there is an authority uh, and a sort of legitimacy in government through focal points, through the same sort of coordination and focal points and conventions that stand behind, in fact, justice, commutative justice, as he says. And so um, Rothbard is wrong to go the whole way and saying, look, if, if, if your neighbor did it, it would be coercion and outrageous. And so if the government does it, it's coercion and outrageous. And I'm saying, no, it's coercion. And we want a semantic which recognizes that, even maybe emphasizes that. You know, we say intervention. We say, you know, we, we, it's not contract, it's intervention. It's taxation. Okay, it's not fee for service. It's, it, but on the other hand, we don't call it extortion, right? We don't call it robbery. Um, so we have this third semantic, which is recognizes the coerciveness of government, but sort of puts it in the category of uh, uh, maybe maybe this is um, you know something we should acquiesce to, something we have to act, as, assent to. We're not going to recognize it as voluntary, though. We're not going to buy into a social democratic view, which sees the polity as one big voluntary club, and so anything the government does is voluntary. If you don't like the club, leave. You're free to leave. Go ahead, leave the UK. No one's stopping you. It's voluntary. No, we don't, we reject that by maintaining this definition of liberty and recognizing that intervention and taxation are coercive. But I don't think, but Rothbard gives up the status quo and, and, and policy uh, um, negotiation and so on, in some sense, you know, in some ways being relevant um, by giving no authority or legitimacy to government at all and focusing on that libertarian end zone rather than the 50 yard line, which is where we're actually at. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Brian. This Q&A is really great, actually. And I think that the Rothbardians and the, you know, the anarchists and the narco-capitalists out there have their place in libertarian circles because it reminds us where we're coming from. But they're not very good at converting the non-believers. So I think that, you know, the Hayek's and the mainstream near libertarianism is a, is a valuable tool to get us to the 10-yard line. Rothbard cases the end zone. 
Yeah, yeah or even, I'll, I'll take the 40 yard line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll take stop, stopping losing ground. ground yeah. right. You explain that to the rest of us what you just, what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> American football's not big. American football? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think we get the picture though. Uh, it comes to you, Sam. If we go to Nigel first and then uh, Joe. Okay. I, I came here knowing that there would be some discussion about directions versus destinations and you in fact have raised that on one of your slides but the question I've got is can you tie down for your mere libertarianism what between where we are now and please feel free to use the USA or the UK as, as you feel between where we are now and the mere libertarian what is the that Hayek would want which you think is not on the route and likewise, for the Rothbardians, what? what is on the mere libertarian agenda, which is not on the route from where we are now to the Rothbardian utopia? I don't know what the route to the Rothbardian... First of all, I don't know what the Rothbardian utopia really is, or what to expect from it. And I don't know what the route to it is, so I have trouble answering that question. But, well, do it for the mere libertarian. <laughs> I, I, can you be a little more specific? What, well, what, what, what would be an example of an answer to your question? <laughs> <laughs> that would help me. What, what do I want to abolish? Okay, let, let's take speed limits, for example. Um, maybe uh, a lot of people believe that speed limits are too restrictive, particularly on the open road, my personal position. Okay. Uh, is there anything in speed limits or other road legislation which the Hayakian position is wrong and will lead n not moving from the current status towards the mere libertarian status, the desirability? Um, you know, I'm really not sure what Hayek would say about speed limits. Um, <laughs> but speed limits... Speed limits are in that range of incompleteness as far as I'm concerned. I'm, re I'm willing to recognize the government's ownership of the government highway, and the owner of the highway is responsible for setting speed limits. They might do a stupid job of it, and I agree with you, they're too low. That's, we see that in that everyone breaks them. Um, uh, um, but but uh, I don't see that much as, as, a, as a liberty issue. Uh, I would be very much inclined to privatize roads and highways. Um, if, if, if that matters, uh, I, I'm inclined, I know that Rothbard would, and I even think that Hyatt would lean that way. At least he says some things in law, legislation, and liberty, which, which uh, seem to suggest such a view. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at, but I think, I mean, I'm not, you know, in the policy community, I'm not, you know, an aide in parliament who has to be respectable. So, um, I'm, you know, I, I think there should be plenty of people uh, like, like, like you guys and, and like us academics who are ready to talk about abolishing whole agencies and whole apparatuses. Uh, uh, but I like to limit the abolitions one per conversation. <laughs> you know, I, li I don't like this. Or I, I prefer. I like abolitionists a lot better than anarchists. I don't really like anarchists. It's too, you know, push the button and God knows what the where you're at, where you are after that. It's kind of like hyperspace. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of thought experiment, you change all the variables at once and your words lose meaning. But you could talk about abolishing, uh, for example, in the U.S. context, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, or at least, or the legislation that authorizes the FDA to permit drugs, in other words, the whole ban till permitted system, I would love to see that whole thing abolished. Um, would Hayek? I bet he would. I'm not sure. I bet he would. Does that help? <laughs> I'll give it gentleman there. Yeah, um, my question is a little bit similar, right? except a bit more perhaps brutal. That is, do you, do you see any reason for optimism in any of the administrations that we currently have throughout, let's say, the West, for argument's sake, in the con in, I, I, are we moving anywhere towards mere libertarianism? I don't consider myself competent to answer that question. Well, uh, can I ask you just about the states? <laughs> even there. Um, <laughs> uh, I see some reasons for optimism. There's just some about things. the Midwest, maybe. Just <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, 
I'm not. I'm, I'm not generally terribly optimistic. Um, uh, I, I don't know what to expect. I see a, a lot of bad trends and a lot of big threats, and I but don't do really you, see how enlightenment is going to get more of an upper hand than <coughs> it's had. Do you see any champions? Do you mm -hmm. see any people who are trying to do this, even? Um, I think so, sure. Um, but um, I mean, in, within the I mean, within the administration, I mean, people people who have influence. Do I don't think he does. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah, go, we'll right. go to the next one. Sorry, go ahead. Sam, up yeah, in the back. Um, thanks very much for talking. I really enjoyed it. But um, the question I have is, when you say undesirability, are you not sure Rothbard actually is the case? that there is, it's possible for it to be undesirable because his argument really is that this is intrinsically undesirable, that the kind of the moral basis of um, the, the kind of capitalist system that he's advocating is intrinsically undesirable because it's derived from some sort of natural rights system. Whereas obviously Hayek makes kind of a fuzzy sort of consequentialist argument. And I wonder, is it possible to, I mean, I think you've done a good job of showing that their, their means uh, can be blended, but if their goals are so sort of completely divergent, then is it possible to blend them in a meaningful way? If Hayek, I'm sorry, if Rothbard's goals are that divergent from Hayek's, then we should jettison him. Um, if it's about having some remarkable principle that he can be sure that even if humanity depended on it, he shouldn't coerce somebody, and that's all that's important to him, good riddance. Um, so, um, yeah, and so and when see, I like breaking this down into all of this idea of reforms and ranking of reforms because it exercises us in, in in thinking about this ordering. It's a whole ordering which creates rankings when you plug stuff into it, and it's the whole ordering <coughs> that 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 Rothbard seems to be denying any cases of undesirability for. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it's through sort of, you know, intellectual magic, as it were, that he insists on that conclusion and, 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 and uh, maintains that conclusion. I don't like that style of reasoning and arguing, um, and I don't, I don't, I think there are exceptions. Uh, perhaps if I could yeah. pick up there, because we skipped through it and when you did the discussion, the examples of undesirability. Maybe it would be, be helpful to us to, what are your, uh, maybe a couple of the killer libertarian undesirables that we should be aware of. Um, let's see what I said here as examples. Um, I don't know what the killers are, and I don't like to be pinned down on this stuff. <laughs> but, um, oh, here I do have completely open borders. Yeah. I mean, presumably the liberty principle would be a completely open, sure. would say completely open borders. Um, I don't, I don't think that when, I don't really know what would happen with completely open borders, but I certainly am willing to entertain the notion that that would throw politics into all sorts of trouble and ultimately result in less overall liberty. And again, this is the direct liberty principle we're using to make this conversation. So I can invoke that as, you know, an exception to direct liberty. Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, should the U.S. not have pitched in against Hitler? I mean, it taxed people, it conscripted people, it dropped bombs on innocent people, and initiated a lot of coercion. Mm -hmm. The direct liberty recommendation would clearly be don't do any of this. Are you really going to bite that bullet? Um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm for small, you know, I don't like government. I don't think it makes sense to governmentalize social affairs. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I hope that people less and less look to the state, the government for meaning in life. So I'm for sort of thera therapy, you know, against the people's romance and the dependence sure. on politics for meaning. So I'm all for rolling it back and rolling it back. Uh, so I don't know. What do you say? What do you think? Well, I mean, obviously the Hitler example is one of the classic ones. Open borders is a problem, I guess. 
Can I come in on bazookas for a moment? Sure. Yes. <laughs> legalizing bazookas, I presume <clears throat> the purpose of legalizing them is not to allow uh, people to oppress and intimidate and terrorize their fellow citizens. It's for legitimate self-defensive purposes. <laughs> my, question, my question is, if you substituted the phrase nuclear weapons, would the principles still apply? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, if, the, if there was a difference in principle, it would be because a nuclear weapon I, is so inherently hazardous and it poses an imminent threat and danger that it is, as it were, the threat of coercion in and of itself. Whereas with a bazooka, you know, a guy could go to the bazooka store and buy his bazooka and mount it over the fireplace and, you know, enjoy his bazooka in the sanctity of his own home without any great threat to anyone else. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there could be a difference there based on that, and that gets back into ambiguity. Like, is this co is, is our nuclear arms uh, uh, coercive, you know, in and of themselves, uh, based on threats and dangers? Um, but you know, would you want to legalize bazookas? Uh, I'm frankly not sure. Um, you know, obviously, uh, this could lead to a lot of private coercion, you know, people capping off bazookas on the roof of their building and landing who knows wherever, maybe they'll see it and take a picture. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the drug war may not be as aggressive as it is against private voluntary people. If, if, if the drug trade were able to tote bazookas legally, or at least, you know, buy them legally, so in that sense, there might be an overall liberty benefit to legalizing bazookas. Um, as there always is, by, uh, you know, in the spirit of the Second Amendment. <laughs> of course, we libertarians could do with an independent nuclear deterrent, right? <laughs> <laughs> there was another question on this side, I think. Or maybe there? Oh, yes. Um, can, can I ask, uh, I'm interested in, in that you're interested not just in the definitions of words, but the words themselves. So you can yeah. check it out, for example. Why choose mere libertarianism over mere liberalism? Wouldn't mm -hmm. that be more the 40 yard line? Um, well, liberalism is a very big battle in and of itself. Uh, and, well, when you say libertarian, you know who your audience is, and your audience knows who's your, who the audience is. Uh, and liberal is immediately you know, entering into a whole big problem, uh, particularly in the US. I'm not sure if it's as extreme here. I don't think it is. Um, it's really extreme in the US. Um, um, but, but you know, like, like, like I showed in, 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 in my early slide here, um, you know, I do like the idea that this is sort of, as it were, a refurbishing of this. Um, I would love to get back liberal, but we have a whole century or more of, you know, cultural and semantic confusion <laughs> to overturn. And all, you know, the intellectual class is predominantly social democratic uh, and everything else. So we're engulfed and we're going to continue to be engulfed in social democratic culture and semantics for a long time. Yeah. All right. Um, it seems mere libertarianism is a unifying school of libertarianism, almost. And I wondered what. Except that no one wants to, wants to sign <laughs> on to it. <laughs> but I, I was uh, wondering on your. Um, your thoughts on how helpful it is to keep the individual schools, Hayek, Rothbard, and others, uh, for analysis given the uh, usefulness in different times. Uh, for example, I would say a Rothbard analysis and policy making would be maybe more helpful in a majority government in the UK, whilst a Hayekian, more flexible one, might be more helpful in a coalition government. Uh, that could be. Uh, I believe in you know yeah, reading them in context and seeing the personalities uh, behind behind uh, the texts, and uh, they could certainly be uh, more pertinent and given in different contexts. I I definitely see that. Um, but again, you know, I I don't like I I want the Rothbardians to be aware of these critiques and so on. I. <laughs> Are you saying that the rock set in with Mises? Uh, that um, uh, Smith and, uh, of course, Hayek, very much in the British empirical uh, school, what, is, what works, oh, it seems to be liberalism seems to work, let's have that. Uh, whereas Mises starts with some so-called self-evident principles from which he then derives uh, certain propositions, 
And then Rothbard, of course, very much in that tradition, carries them on, uh, and I suppose you might say shows their absurdity. I mean, is, is that really what you're <laughs> Um, there's a grain of truth to that, I think. Um, we should mind that he is that way really only in economics. He's not particularly that way in ethics or politics. Um, but but, but, but he, he, as it were, takes that in, in Mises' economics and, and sort of does it in both and, and all. Um, but, you know, I, I've been critical of him. Um, and I've been making efforts to actually advocate retiring the term Austrian economics, so I've often been criticizing these two in particular. But on the other hand, there's a lot, uh, I'd really be ready to come to his defense in a lot of ways. I think he's a totally epic and great figure. I think he's in some sense the single person who's, who's the bridge more than anyone else between this and 20th century libertarianism. Um, and, you know, he was, he, he didn't enjoy the good times that Adam Smith enjoyed, uh, and he felt extremely embattled on all fronts at all levels, and he sort of took everyone on at the same time, which doesn't work, and is one of the reasons that his works read so badly, I think. But on the other hand, I, you know, I, I, I can hardly imagine what it would be like if he hadn't. <laughs> now, maybe he could have done something better, but... Um, you know, when you really think about his situation in life and, and so on, you know, every, you know, I don't know, I still have tremendous reverence for Mises, I must say. But there's a grain of truth to that. But you know, you know, he's living in the tide of collectivism. And it's so hard, it's so changed. I mean, within like two generations, liberalism was devastated. All the young people were other than liberal and calling themselves liberal. Um, so it was just such a bad time, it's, it's hard to come down on. I have a sense of how many people still have burning questions. All right, well, Felix, we'll let you ask yours, and then we'll leave a little time again just for informal discussion. Um, so, Felix, you want to go ahead? Okay, sure. Um, well, it seems that you treat uh, liberalism essentially as a good, maybe as an economic good, given your, your sort of background in this uh, perspective, but uh, in doing so, instead of taking perhaps a more utilitarian view of liberty and how to maximize it as a good, uh, do you, are you in danger of forgetting individuals of having the, the liberty of everyone, so sort of, or liberty maximizing trample on individual rights or people? Is that not the problem with this sort of approach? Mm. I don't think so. <clears throat> um, I don't really think that free market policies and such uh, lead to individual rights getting trampled. Um, can you give me an example of how you think they do? Well, uh, I'm more just thinking if you're in terms of maximizing something generally, that if there's a trade-off between rights, you know, maybe my right to free speech versus you know, someone else's property rights or something like that. Um, but, you know, even in terms of maximizing liberty, you might just squash someone's right to something uh, rather than respect it as, a, as an equal right with the world in itself. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this, these liberty rights. I don't know exactly what free speech rights you have in mind. I might not have that higher regard for what it is you have in mind. If you want to have free speech on my property, uh, I might be ready to say that's not a right of yours. Um, but I just want, I want to caution you that the word maximization is not fitting for the spirit of this. Maximization to me suggests a quite clearly articulated maximand. And that is exactly what the loose vague and indeterminacy of the aesthetic, of the desirability, of the realm of exceptions, you know, all gets away from. Uh, I do not see uh, this liberalism as grammatical. I mean, it's got this presumption, okay? But that still doesn't make it grammatical. Okay. All right. I'm going to draw things to a close uh, about here. Dan, I think that was fantastic. It's um, probably over the last few years I've lost hours, I think days of my life, arguing with people 
this distinction, Hayek and Rothbard, different schools of libertarianism, different schools of economics. Um, and uh, so I think it, it's a very valuable enterprise trying to blend them. In fact, I'd go so far as to say anyone who tries and, and it succeeds to a certain extent in blending Rothbard and Hayek and can give me those days of my life back, or at least save me some days of my life in the future, uh, deserves a medal. Uh, so here we have one with the great man. Uh, wow. Thank you very much.